Good day, everybody. This is Chris with the Ancient Scholar. I hope this video finds you all doing well, considering the contemporary situations and circumstances we find ourselves in as a world. So today is going to be a very important update, and this is going to be, in my opinion, a paradigm-changing update. And again, I want to emphasize that I am not here giving medical advice, and nor am I telling anyone to go against uh, whatever established uh, clinical practice guidelines they have at their facility or service. This is just information that I'm disseminating in an attempt to provide the most relevant and up-to-date um, information that's currently available uh, with the caveat that uh, the information is changing hour by hour, it seems, as an immense amount of uh, evidence is being presented and being published. All right, so this is going to be COVID-19 update, changing airway management paradigm, possibly. So this is actually coming out of uh, experiences uh, from uh, New York and New York hospitals and from uh, retrospectively looking back at uh, how patients did or are doing uh, from the Italians and looking at Italian data. Uh, much of this data is not uh, the traditional data and that it's randomized controlled trials, but rather it is... Uh, um, large series of case reviews, and so you have to take the limitations of that data into consideration. Uh, so what are we finding? Well, we're finding that many seemingly quote-unquote critical patients, right, these are patients, and I've talked about these before, patients that have low saturation, so their SpO2s are low, you know, they're in the 80s, they're tachypnic, right? They have a respiratory rate greater than 25, and they may even have low PF ratios, you know, less than 200. So these are patients who we would classically think of as developing ARDS. Uh, they have a, a, just a classic uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome uh, presentation, uh, type 1 respiratory failure, a hypoxic respiratory failure. They need to be intubated. Well, what we're seeing in a lot of cases these patients, many of these patients, actually remain awake and cooperative. So in spite of having low saturations, in spite of being a little tachypnic, in spite of maybe even having low PF ratios, they're awake, cooperative, and they can actually put themselves in a prone position. So the question is, when we take patients like this and we intubate them, many intubated patients do very poorly. And as far back as just a day ago, I was saying that you intubate somebody, a severe COVID-19 case, and what are we looking at? Somewhere around 50% mortality rate in intubated patients. And I thought, and probably still many people think, that this mortality may in fact be due to the disease process itself or uh, possibly uh, the uh, uh, the immune system, some immunopathology involving cytokines, involving um, um, interleukin expression um, that is actually causing problems to develop. And it, in fact, may be something else. And the question that is being posed now is, is the following. Is the intubation and subsequent mechanical intubation actually causing harm? Right, uh, and when I was in respiratory school, and um, you know, I worked with intubated patients. Kind of our guiding principle was: what's the, what's the um, underlying, what's the underlying goal of an intubated patient? And the underlying goal is to attempt to get them extubated as soon as possible. Right, there are lots of problems associated with intubation, and so the question is: is intubation, mechanical intubation, causing harm in these patients? So. Are these high mortality rates, at least in part, due to the fact that they're being intubated? That's the question that's being posed. And again, this is coming from people that are working in New York, uh, physicians. This is coming from data. It's coming out of um, Italy. And so that's kind of the question that I want to pose here is if you have somebody who's awake, who's cooperative, who can move themselves, and is not experiencing encephalopathy, that is to say that they're not having cognitive, their brain isn't shutting down because they're hypoxic, so they're awake, they're oriented, they're cooperative. Maybe they have low SATs, maybe they're tachypnic, maybe their PF ratio is low, but perhaps 
if they are awake, cooperative, and able to work with you, perhaps initiating some form of non-invasive uh, therapy, non-invasive ventilatory therapy, such as high-flow nasal cannula or CPAP, uh, CPAP using a good viral filter to uh, help with infection control and high flow nasal cannula and perhaps using that in concert with uh, say a surgical mask or something like that to help decrease the risk of aerosolization and help enhance infection control practices there. And then allowing that patient or actually telling that patient to put themselves in a prone position and then every so often change their position around. Uh, so this is being reported in a couple of really good podcasts and uh, really good uh, repositories for current medical information. The first one I'm going to quote uh, that I'm quoting is the MCRIT podcast. That's the uh, uh, a podcast and a uh, website um, that is uh, managed by Dr. Scott Weingard. And uh, the uh, specific article is Stop Knee Jerk Intubation with the EM Crit crew and is an article and a podcast that was just published March 30th, 2020. So you can reference that using the following information. Uh, the other one is the uh, foam cast and the name of the article is quote unquote COVID cast, awake proning, hydroxychloroquine update, neonatal updates, and that was also released March 30th, 2020, um, but it was recorded back on March 28th, 2020. And I am recording this video on uh, March 30, 2020, and it probably will not be published until March 31st, 2020, after I get done with all the editing. Um, some specific um, articles that I want to uh, reference um, so that, that are actually specifically referenced in the Foamcast uh, podcast. The first one is um, a letter to the editor um, by uh, Kin Sun et al. Uh, so this is, this is Chinese data, and the name of that is uh, Lower Mortality of COVID-19 by Early Recognition and Intervention, dot, dot, dot. Uh, this was published in the Annals of Intensive Care, March 18th, 2020. You can reference that. Uh, the next one is an article by Lin Ding et al., uh, published in Critical Care, March of 2020, and the name of that article is Efficacy and Safety of Early Prone Positioning Combined with uh, HFNC, that is High Flow Nasal Cannula, or NIV, Non-Invasive Ventilation, in Moderate to Severe ARDS, a multi-center prospective cohort study. So this is actually some legit research that is being published. Um, this is being published in the uh, in uh, critical care. This is open access and it is not hidden behind a paywall. Um, so you can actually reference these studies. Um, and I would strongly suggest that you listen and read both the MCRIT and the uh, FOAMCAST. The FOAMCAST is very good. In addition, they actually talk about what happens when we prone patients and how um, pulmonary pressure gradients can change and that can allow us to recruit alveoli that um, are generally uh, very atelectatic in um, patients who are laying in a, a supine position or a more traditional position. Uh, so uh, very good information uh, in both of those and I strongly suggest that you take a look at them if you haven't already. Okay, so just a, a sort of algorithm to kind of help help with decision making or to help kind of sum everything up into a, a high yield uh, way of looking at this situation. The first question we want to ask is, is the patient awake, spontaneously breathing, and cooperative? If the answer to that is yes, regardless of what their, you know, maybe their saturation is 85%, maybe their PF ratio is 180, right? They, they look like they need to be intubated, but if they're awake, spontaneously breathing, and cooperative, Perhaps look at beginning high flow nasal cannula. Um, in a general rule of thumb, if you're looking at high, high flow nasal cannula, just down and dirty, you can start about 30 liters per minute and then titrate the FiO2 up. Um, 
30 liters per minute, you can go higher, certainly, but 30 liters per minute, it might help decrease the incidence of aerosolization. Um, so you can kind of go on the lower end of the flow and then titrate the FiO2 up for the patient and then have that patient prone themselves and change their position every hour or so. Um, and then you could transition to CPAP, um, give them you know, 10, maybe 8 to 10 of, um, of a PEEP uh, slash CPAP and titrate it up and down. And again, have that patient self-prone. And as long as they're awake, oriented, talking to you, cooperative, right? Have them prone themselves, watch them closely, and perhaps pull back from the abyss of intubation if these patients continue to remain awake and spontaneously breathing and cooperative. They may very well get through this. However, if no, right, so they develop severe respiratory distress, and more specifically, they develop hypercarbia, so they now have a type 2 respiratory failure where they are not ventilating, which is less common in the COVID-19 patients. They tend to ventilate okay. It's oxygenation that's this problem. And then in these particular cases, we may be forced uh, to intubate these patients uh, to try to stabilize them. However, some caveats that we're finding is it may be better to try to keep these patients awake and spontaneously breathing and place them in APRV. And APRV is a specialty mode of ventilation that stands for airway, pressure, release, ventilation. I actually have a video of APRV, and uh, maybe I'll try to link it uh, down in the description. It's a, a video where I actually set a ventilator up in APRV. I believe I do that on a, a Draeger a Vita XL uh, ventilator and demonstrate what the actual settings look like. Um, I'll just briefly talk about APRV ventilation um, at the end of this particular video. Uh, another key takeaway point, and this is something I have not emphasized in prior videos. I have said that these patients have an ARDS-like presentation or an ARDS-like picture, and what I mean by that is they tend to have hypoxemia, often refractory hypoxemia. However, there's something very different. Often these patients will poorly oxygenate, but they will not necessarily have poor lung compliance, right? So your typical ARDS patient, right, the typical ARDS patient that we deal with tend to have very poorly compliant lungs, right? So their lungs, in essence, are very stiff, very difficult to open up. And so they tend to have very high... Uh, high peak inspiratory pressures, very high plateau pressures, very low uh, static and dynamic compliance, right? So they're very poorly compliant lungs. Oftentimes, the, the COVID-19 patients will have decent compliance, but they will still, for reasons that aren't well understood at this point, have a very hard time following intubation and the initiation of mechanical ventilation. And there are many factors there, and there, are even, there may even be a selection bias at play as well. But I don't know that the early intubation paradigm that I've talked about in earlier videos is necessarily going to be a panacea and is necessarily the absolute best paradigm that we should be following at this point. It's probably going to be a little more nuanced. And hopefully I've provided you enough information to uh, help with better uh, decisions in the future when dealing with these patients. The last thing I want to do is just briefly talk about airway pressure release ventilation. This isn't going to be a, a comprehensive discussion, but just kind of give you a flavor of what that is. So airway pressure release ventilation is essentially, it is a modified form of CPAP. CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. It's essentially a modified form of CPAP for intubated patients. So what you do, and, and I have a, I have a, here a 
pressure time waveform. So pressure, airway pressure, is a function of time. And so what we do is we set some pressure here. And let's say this pressure is 30 centimeters of water. All right, so relatively high pressure. And what we do is we keep that patient at this high pressure for an extended period of time. And then on top of that pressure, this patient is spontaneously breathing. Those are these little dips here that you see. These are spontaneous breaths. So this is essentially just CPAP, right? I put somebody on CPAP, um, and if I crank the CPAP up to 30, that is the, the majority of APRV right there. Now, the difference is that at very specific intervals for very short periods of time, less than a second typically, what we will do or what the ventilator will do is it will release the pressure. So it will hold this patient at this high pressure for several seconds. And again, the patient needs to be spontaneously breathing for this to really work. But it'll hold them at this high pressure, and then it will release this pressure for a very short interval of time, and then it'll boom, go right back up into that 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 pressure high that you set. Um, and so you have these these sustained periods of time at high pressure, followed by very rapid releases, and that's where the term airway pressure release ventilation comes into play. And so these rapid pressure releases are thought to help with uh, ventilation, right? Kind of help move more air in and out of the lungs um, occasionally and help eliminate carbon dioxide um, because you, you're going to expect probably some degree of hypercapnia. So you may have some permissive, some permissive hypercapnia that you're going to deal with. Um, but that's why it's so important to have that patient spontaneously breathing, right? So they are moving gas in and out of their lungs. And so when you have these patients who are intubated, it's going to be very important, um, I would think, to monitor, right? You want to continuously monitor carbon dioxide. So you want continuous uh, quantitative, continuous, quantitative carbon dioxide monitoring. Typically, that'll be the form, in the form of a waveform capnography. That's going to be, I think, best practice with these patients. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little bit of more sense what APRV is. It, it really is a, a, uh, a slightly more complex form of CPAP for an intubated patient. Um, and again, it's important that these patients are spontaneously breathing or they're not going to ventilate very well. Right, so if uh, perhaps a better paradigm would to be to intubate the patient using a very short-acting neuromuscular blocker, um, neuromuscular blocking agent, something like succinylcholine, and then a very rapid-acting um, induction agent, say something like propofol, so you can intubate the patient rapidly and then get the patient breathing spontaneously very rapidly so we can institute a PRV. Uh, because that might be an optimal mode for these um, kinds of patients. Uh, all right, so I think I'm going to cut it off here. I hope you guys found this video helpful. Um, when I listen to these podcasts and I read the articles mentioned in the podcasts, it really makes sense to me. I think they're on to something, and I think that we might need to pull back from the abyss of just, oh, they're not doing well on nasal cannula, Right, I've, I've had to bump them up four, five, six liters in nasal cannula. They're still not oxygenating well. Boom, just intubate them early. I think we need to pull back from that paradigm a little bit, particularly with younger, healthier patients who are awake and oriented and able to work with us. I think we should work them a little bit, get them proning themselves, get them moving around, and see if we can get them through this a little bit before we jump on the intubation bandwagon because it very well may be harmful for some patients. Okay, I'm going to cut off here. I hope you guys found this, uh, this particular topic compelling and helpful. Take care.